So thank you again for being here. Yeah. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, your artistic background, and um, about ZineFest. Yeah. My name is Anastasia Karajas, uh, and I am a Houston-based collage artist, zinester, and community organizer. I am a native Houstonian and went to school to get my undergrad in art history at the University of Texas in Austin. And I have been involved in ZineFest Houston since 2011 when I started tabling. And then I became one of the lead organizers for the festival in 2013. And so that is my role in the organization. Awesome. So as much time as you spent there, I'm sure you've seen a lot of growth and evolutions. Um, talk a little bit about like when you first started at ZineFest compared to now and what those changes have been. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 2011 was a while ago. <laughs> and when I first started, it was a small, smaller team. It was Lindsay Simard and Shane Patrick Boyle, one of the founders of ZineFest, uh, who unfortunately passed away in 2017. And I just wanted to get involved in terms of like tabling at the event. One of my friends from UT saw a flyer. Oh, if you hear any sounds, it's my dog walking around. <laughs> um, she, she pointed out to me and she was like, oh, this sounds really cool. Do you want a table? And, and I was like, sure, yeah, well, I'll do it. And so we shared a table and it was on the rooftop of cons in Midtown. And I think it was in like July or August. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, somehow we were out there uh, and it went into the evening time and it was, I'm trying to remember how many people that were tabling there. I think it was like 30 or so. Um, and then, I mean, over the years since I've been involved, it's just grown so much. Uh, mostly, I mean, zines have become really popular yeah and now we have like 80 plus uh 90 plus vendors wow. who, who table at the fest um and we get i mean at least like 100 applications um so we don't really turn anyone away yeah um it's yeah it's just grown a lot yeah. And so um, with the growth of just just the vendors, I'm sure you've had also had to grow in like team size and venue size and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So we the first one that I was at was at cons. And then the second one was at Super Happy Fun Land. That was in 2012. And then from the years 2013 to 2014, we were at the Printing Museum. Um, on their West Clay Street space. And we outgrew that space. And so from 2015 to 2018 or 19, we were at Lawndale Art Center. And that was a really good space for a little bit, but we also grew outgrew that one. Um, and so what we were looking for in our next phase is just like, big open space and the luckily the orange show has a warehouse space and it's open air so you know after covid we realized that you know we want we want people to be comfortable and safe um as much as possible still and so we were like oh you know would it be possible to partner with y'all in in for you to host the fest and and they said yes and um it's been really great to to be there yeah so you've been there a few, for a few years now yeah so in, in 2020 we did a six hour streamed online fest which uh was a lot of work um i don't regret doing it but it was very different and it, it felt good to interact with everyone during that time and yeah um you know we, we try to keep it like the same vibe you know we like to have fun with things and so um that was really fun but then 
you know, 2021, we, we were like, okay, let's look for a different space. Um, and that's how the partnership with the Orange Show came about. Gotcha. So, so we've been there since 2021. Awesome. So you think you'll stay there for a while? This is like a good <laughs> fit right now. <laughs> so, I mean, I hope so. We, we don't have any uh, plans to go anywhere else right now. They, they really provide everything that we need and, and they're easy to work with. Um, if you do big events, it's always helpful to have um, the an organization or partner with an organization that aligns with their mission too. Right. And so I feel like the Orange Show, you know, they're quirky, uh, out a little bit out there. They yeah. like that fun as well. And so I feel like it just is a really great partnership for both of us. For sure. Um, so speaking of partnerships, um, it sounds like you've had to secure a lot of partnerships for, for venues specifically, but I'm sure for other things too. How does, um, how do things, so part one of my question is like, how do you go about sustaining those like, uh, successful relationships or securing them in the first place and then nurturing them over time so that you can do things like grow your event in bigger spaces? Yeah. Um, uh, so one of the re the ways that we do secure partnerships is through word of mouth. That's mm -hmm. a pretty big way. And people just, I mean, they kind of, they find out about us through the online. And so they'll just like reach out to us. Like, I think um, in 2013, we started doing uh, zine workshops with the Harris County Public Library System. Mm -hmm. And so it just, got around to a lot of the library branches that yeah. these this group of people does this and so they uh, a lot of the librarians contacted us and they were like hey do you want to do like a summer teen zine workshop and we're like yeah that sounds fun that's awesome um, yeah and so like sustaining those relationships over the years it just takes like you know i mean i think a lot of it is also like showing up to events and yeah. stuff. So it's just like, if you're an event organizer in the community, one of the main ways to sustain those partnerships is to actually like show up at the other organization's event. Right. <laughs> you know, so it, it's like, you get to know the people who work there and like um, through that, it, it helps like create more sustainability in terms of your event, you know, cause they know that oh, hey, this person like actually shows up like, yeah, I mean, it's it is important physically to be there. Um, it's an it, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, aside from partnerships, then uh, what do you think are some of the other like key ingredients that that maybe you may not have even done intentionally, but um, some of the other things that helped uh, Zinefest grow? over the past decade into from what it started as is into what it is now? Well, one of the main things I'd say would be fiscal sponsorship, which Fresh Arts has really helped out the community doing. And that is something that we applied to, I think back in 2017 is one of the first years that we started doing it. And from that, we've really been able to grow and offer our artists competitive rate pay rates you know um and so that's something that like we have always wanted to do but just like didn't have the resources to do and that's been a really a, like a game changer really you know we've been able to keep our table costs low you know ours is one of the lowest still i mean we we haven't really changed the price it's um 30 for full table and 15 dollars for a half table and fortunately wow. we're able to keep it we've been able to keep it at that price for many years and through getting uh grants through like houston arts alliance um we're we're able to continue to do that gotcha yeah so when you say uh, using the fiscal sponsorship program, you mean primarily for grant grant funding? Yes, and also rentals too, which is a new thing that 
um, we're getting uh, turned on to through the Houston Tool Bank. And that is something that I learned through Jesse Bowman of Flats. And she was like, oh, we can apply for uh, rentals through the Houston Tool Bank mm -hmm. under the fiscal sponsorship program. And that's been really helpful too. Cause like, you know, if you're doing events, you have to think about different rental companies and, you know, there's kind of a monopoly here in Houston, but the, things like the Houston Tool Bank uh, really help out smaller organizations and other people doing events that, you know, wouldn't be able to rent from like a bigger company because it, their costs are really high. Yeah. What uh, what kind of things were you guys doing before you got fiscal sponsorship? Like for maybe for somebody who's kind of starting at at that uh, starting place and wants to do a big event, rent things, doesn't have access to the things you have access through the fiscal sponsorship program. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah. So those were the days when <laughs> we did our own fundraiser right. and we Basically, if you've thrown a party, I, I would kind of look at it that way. So like, you know, what do people do at parties? I mean, they enjoy music, they enjoy food and drinks. Um, you've got to find a space. I think that's one of the most important things is to like, think about where you want to host this potential event. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if it's for the purpose of raising money, you know, it's like, what kinds of things are going to be a deterrent to someone coming to this? Like, right. is there going to be parking? Like, yeah. is parking easy? Um, are, is there an ADA accessible ramp? You know, it's like that. That's also really important to having um, accessibility for all types of people. Um, and then if someone doesn't want to come because of X, Y, and Z, like, do you have other options that people will be able to donate to you mm -hmm. um, You can do like um, an online donation uh, platform as well? We've, we've done GoFundMes um, and that's, that's pretty easy to, to set up actually. Um, and so you, do, so you actually don't need a physical space for that, but you can like built in um, like some alternative like experiences, I guess. So, so yeah. that's like another way to go about, you know, finding access to things. Like if you need to raise money for your event space, like, you know, maybe set up a GoFundMe and then just like go from there, you know? Yeah. And as a creative person uh, or group of people, like you can come up with ways that like people things that people will want to give you money for like people have patreon accounts people have yeah. digital products mm -hmm. um yeah so getting getting that fundraising going building those partnerships finding the space mm -hmm. um building from there uh so we talked about um things that have helped you grow what about things that have challenged your growth covid probably being one of them you guys were able to overcome that through hosting an, a virtual event yeah. Um, what are some other potential obstacles or challenges that someone in the beginning phases might run into or that you guys ran into? I would say what, yeah, I mean, finding a space is actually one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, we, we still have, we still <laughs> face yeah, that challenge know, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, I think like if you don't have a space, it just makes everything such a challenge. <laughs> Another challenge I would say would be like capacity of the organizing team. Mm, so, yeah. So that's kind of gone through phases. And right now we have a lot, uh, a, a stronger amount of people, like a bigger amount of people. Um, but some of our capacity is lower now. You know, I mean, people go through changes in life. You know, people have kids, you know, job changes, family, other obligations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when it comes to doing events, sometimes 
people who don't organize events maybe forget that we're also human <laughs> and and it's not our full-time job to yeah. do so it's it's kind of like you know we're doing the best we can with the amount of people that we have and the capacity but sometimes it's a challenge <laughs> yeah absolutely um i've definitely been on that side myself where it's like you want to put on the best event possible but you've only got so many people you've only got so much money to pay these people <laughs> yeah um is how many full-time do you have any full-time members on your team um i i guess in the terms of like yes full-time would be like five right now okay um but and and that's like you know the core organizing team yeah and so outside of that we do have a lot of like volunteers that we yeah contact the day of mostly yeah volunteers are huge i bet for you guys yeah you know i mean we always tend to i mean you always need more volunteers than you think you will need <laughs> that is what i will say <laughs> yeah so obviously the fest happens once a year right mm -hmm. um and so what are some of the other you thought you talked a little bit about like doing workshops at the library um are there other things you guys do throughout the year outside of just the festival to keep to keep kind of the organization going yeah so we do a annual compilation and we've been doing that since 2012 i think Lin Lindsay was the one who started that and we kept going with it and so each year we'll put out a call for submissions and we usually have it in line with the theme and so then we'll have like a release party kind of leading up to the fest um we've been having it at axelrad for a couple of years now and so we have the compilation release and then we'll do like some fun activity like bingo to get people engaged and have prizes and so it's just like a mini gathering, like a little celebration of zine, zine people and anyone who's submitted to the comp can come and like get their free coffee. So that's a, nice. a fun event. Um, the other one we do is Comics Gauntlet, which we tried to do this year, but the rain uh, storms um, didn't let us get, you know, have it this year. So when we usually have that, it's a 24 hour comic day inspired event where we have uh, seven, seven artists do a seven page comic in seven hours. And so the, the artists um, will draw during the day and then in the evening we'll take the, those pages and we'll get it printed up, assemble the book, uh, zine rather. And um, then we'll have a, release party for that and, and then we'll have like display the artwork on the walls and and have that event too so that so ideally that's usually in the spring and um then when we open registration in the summertime it's kind of like gearing up for the zine season <laughs> in the fall yeah gotcha that's awesome so aside from the main event if you will there's um, a series of other events and leading up to those, there's like ways that you're engaging artists in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm sure that helps a lot with like attendance to the main event. Yeah, um, when, whenever we partner with an organization for something, we'll tell them about the festival or, you know, whenever one of the organizers is out tabling, like in, in, at like an informational type event, we'll have flyers about the fest. And um, this year we're gonna do a couple of workshops in partnership with the Orange Show leading up to the fest. And so those will be other ways to get the word out about the main event in November. So main event coming up in November, can you talk about, um, so using Zine Fest 2024 as an example, Walk us through some of the key steps in the event planning process. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go from backwards. So after we take a break, after the last fest, so December is kind of like our downtime. <laughs> sure. And then 
January comes around, we're like, okay, maybe we should start thinking about this year's theme or artist. And, you know, February, we're like, okay, now we have to get this started. <laughs> and sometimes we, or lately we've been doing a poll with uh, suggestions for the theme. Yeah. And this year, Zine, Zinetopia Dystopia won. Mm. Which is very reflective of the time that we're living in, I think. Sure. And um, then we also have the artist Ganzier, who we're, we're working with. And he, he has tabled at the fest before. Um, he's very uh, politically minded and a socially conscious artist. So I think the, the pairing with the team worked really well. Uh when you say artist, you mean like a fe like a featured artist for the yeah. event? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the featured artist will usually do our promo materials. Um, gotcha. Like the compilation cover and the poster, for, you know, for the main festival. And then we usually ask them to have like some assets for mm -hmm. our website to, to make it all cohesive. And so after we pick the artist and the theme, then we kind of like roll out the compilation submissions. Um, so then we'll get that going. And then in midsummer, kind of like mid, mid August, we open registration. And so a lot of this is already like language that we've used before. Right. So, so that saves us some time. But the long part or the, the part that takes the most is actually going through the applications. So like once the registration closes, which is like early September, then we will each go through the applications uh, as a team and, you know, we'll meet and talk about them. And like I said, I mean, it's mostly like first come first serve. So now that we have a set venue, we know the capacity of the mm -hmm. venue and we either add some tables depending on like you know, maybe we had a lot, a little bit more people apply this year and there's just some people that we don't want to say no to. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll try to fit everyone in if we can. And so, I mean, and, but there are some applications that we, that we can't accept because they sell jewelry or, you know, they sell clothes. Mm -hmm. I think like, people who haven't been to the fest before and they they apply if they sell like different merchandise you know i mean there's there's events like that for them yeah already, you know and so i hate saying no to people but it's also like you know i mean this this is a zine focused event so right you know i i suggest you i all i'm always like you know come check out the event if you feel like your products or you know work does fit then like yes please apply but if not then you will know the vibe <laughs> and um and you're so right there's plenty of there's <laughs> plenty of artist markets in houston there's lots yeah. of opportunities for them you know so and people are generally understanding i think like yeah um then after registration happens um you know we send out acceptance emails and basically just work the day of to get like everything set for like the table you know tables and chairs and just make sure everything is in line for the day of yeah um, the logistics mm -hmm, yeah and also um what is the other thing that we do? oh yes we also do programming mm -hmm. that goes uh with the theme most of the time um and so we have like talks and panels and workshops on the day of. And so getting that set as well, you know, we're, we're working on that uh, simultaneously as we're doing registration and, you yeah. know, people dropping out and then yep. like all of that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I have a couple of questions uh, that I just thought of as you were talking. Um, yep. So about the, like securing the programming parts, like the panelists, mm -hmm. the whatnot. So how, because knowing because you've done this for so long, um, knowing that people will drop out and things yeah. will happen. How mm -hmm. far ahead do you start planning stuff like that? Oh, man. I would say, I mean, as early as like 
the first half of the year, you know, yeah. like, um, and, and sometimes we have ideas that roll over, which, which we haven't gotten around to. Mm -hmm. So we're like, Oh, Hey, you know, we really wanted to do this. Like maybe this year we're, we're able to do like panel with X, Y, and Z or something. Yeah. Um, and like for the, uh, germination station theme, which was in 2020, um, we wanted to do like a seed, something with seeds, um, but it didn't really work out because, you know, everyone was isolated. And so mm -hmm. this year, uh, Sarah Welch, one of the team organizers was like, oh, what if we did like a seed swap table this year? Um, and so I think we're trying to figure that out. Um, and so it's just like having things in the rotation, but also, uh, I mean, com yeah, coming up with programming as soon as we can sometimes it doesn't fall together until like <laughs> the last minute mm -hmm. um because you know i mean as much as people try to plan there are just like sometimes it doesn't happen <laughs> yeah and so you like as an event organizer you have to be flexible when things don't happen and so it's like what do you do with that it's yeah you know, I mean, so you have to just like go with the flow sometimes. Absolutely. Being flexible, being patient, giving yourself yeah. some grace. <laughs> but again, sometimes like at the last minute, you're still scrambling. It, yeah. <laughs> it be like that. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked a little bit about your uh, planning process for, for Zine Fest 2024, uh, but that's given that you've done this a bunch of times. When you think back to the very beginning, um, what what's some advice for somebody who's like just starting? Maybe this is their first uh, fest, first event they're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. What are like the first steps you would uh, consider? Are they the same as the ones that you guys still do today? Um, also, what are some little um, maybe obstacles you would advise them to look out for? Resources you can advise them to look into? Yeah, I would say that in, if you're just starting out doing events and you want to like grow it, information gathering is a really good resource and important, an important maybe and maybe overlooked one actually, you know, like informational interviews. Yeah. I think are really good if there's an event that you admire and you are looking to put, you know, have do something like that yourself, I would reach out to the organizer mm -hmm. and be like, hey, can I pick your brain about this? And I mean, offer to buy them coffee, you know, like, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a thankless job sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a coffee can go a long way. And, and m most event organizers are so down to share their knowledge as well. You know, it's like if someone contacted me and was like, hey, like, you know, I'm looking to do this. And I'd be like, yeah, like, that's exciting. You know, I, I want to help you uh, do something, you know, for the community. Not not physically, but like in terms of like information. Like, sure. yeah, I you want to do this thing and I don't have to organize it. Okay, go forth and <laughs> do it. Um, but you know, I'll try to help you as much as I can. Um, and so that would be a really good thing to do. Um, attending events is probably another good way to, to see kind of the structure of what's out there. Cause like, you know, I mean, there's all types of spaces like breweries, um, you know, other nonprofits, um, parks i mean you know those are underutilized mm -hmm. and i would say that maybe doing it like the off season when it's like not as rainy or hot would be yeah. really good um for that or looking for something with like covering is always a good way to go yeah yeah Con consider your location. Consider that we're in Houston and things yeah. are not going to get crazy. <laughs> location is very key. Um, I think, yeah, informational 
interviews is like really that's a good one. Good. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> something that uh, like not everybody would would think of. Yeah, think of something that you already like. Go mm -hmm. go there. Talk to the people. Figure mm -hmm. out you know because if you're starting from square one, like you're not you can only Google so much. Like how much does this cost? How do I secure this thing? How do I you know talk to the people who are doing it? Yeah, and um, yes, preferably not while they're at the event. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, again, it's like you're running around that day. Um, being at the event is just like a whirlwind in itself. It's like, you know, I mean, it, again, I'm going to use the analogy of a party. It's like you're throwing a big party. It's yeah. like, you know, your friends are there. You're like attendees. Like in terms of myself, my family is always at the Zine Fest Houston. So it's like, you know, they're there all the time. <laughs> So it's like my family is there um, and it's you're just, busy. Yeah, yeah, you're busy. So so talking to someone like outside of the event is a plus. So um, we talked a little bit on funding already. Talked about how fiscal sponsorship has helped you guys secure grants. We've talked about how if you're just starting out, some of that grassroots fundraising is helpful. Um, one thing we didn't mention, though, that I want to touch on is sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Um, so partnerships, yes, but also sometimes you need somebody to give you money. <laughs> you need somebody to, space is great, but can you sponsor food and beverage? Can you sponsor this and that? Have you guys had experiences with that? Yes, we have. Um, we have been in this, you know, event organizing festival business, uh, business for a lot, a long time. <laughs> and so we've gotten to know, the people who work at the breweries mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, food trucks. Uh, yes. It's really great to have um, a, another rotation of like food trucks to mm -hmm. if, if you're looking to add that component to an event. Um, and then also like reaching out to other like uh, similar events mm. to get um, ideas like where to find sponsors. So for example, Sarah Welch, uh, I think she had attended Denver Zine Fest, mm -hmm. uh, she and her partner James from Mystic Multiples, and they got a donation. The Denver Zine Fest got a donation from Liquid Death. This was like a sparkle mm -hmm. brand. And so she brought that back and was like, hey, like, what if we reach out to them? And because that was like something that she enjoyed at that fest. And mm -hmm you know, luckily we were able to get a donation from them. And so it's, it's just, you know, finding like, just being really observant and seeing like, oh, this, this fest has this idea, you know, it's like, what, what can we do that's similar or, you know, try to, try to fit that in. And, um, you know, maybe they don't have that brand here, but they have Topo, like we have Topo Chico. They're yeah. they're always down to sponsor and give donations. So I would say like Topo Chico is a really good one. Um, St. Arnold's is another good uh, supporter of the community. They have a lot of different events. Um, but, you know, if they're too busy or, you know, if they don't have the capacity, then I would say maybe like reaching out to a mid-sized brewery would be good, like equal parts. Um they are always down to host events too. Um, they're like a really great community supporter as well. Yeah, I know um, Bad Astronauts, another one that does a lot of arts events. Yeah. Um, typically, any typically local businesses are down to support local organizations, yes. right? Yeah, that's a really good good like keeping it local is is always going to be like the best. And do you have any um, tips for that securing sponsorship? process like is it as simple as just going like hey i'm doing a thing <laughs> can you help me out um sometimes yeah you know i mean like um if it's yeah i would say when reaching out to sponsors you want to include like a personal detail that would make you stand out from the rest of you know everyone everyone's out here trying to get free stuff like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you put in there that like you would go there every Sunday with your grandma or, you right. know, <laughs> enjoy this um, beverage and, you know, it brings back memories or something just, you know, so you're not, it is a cold 
sometimes you, you can get around doing like a cold ask, but um, if you either calling them on the phone or like doing an, uh, sending an email, like try to, try to include something that's like, Hey, like I know the product and I'm not just asking for a favor. Yeah. It's a little bit of a personal human connection. Yeah. And I, and I tend to do, I prefer talking to people on the phone. You know, if you send someone an email and you're like emailing them, maybe like the third time and, and it's just like easier to put, like if you hear a human voice on the phone, then it's like, okay, you're not a robot. Just like sending Absolutely. me. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Plus emails get lost. People get busy. Like you, yeah. you don't want to be lost in the sea of emails and then think, think, take it personally. Like it's on you that. Right. Yeah. I, and, and I always follow up with a phone call anyways. So that is another tip too. It's like, if you're doing sponsorships, you have to be on it. Like, you know, don't, don't give up after like a second email, like give them a call. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So last, last big question here. Uh, looking back on your time at scene fest, what do you think has been the most rewarding aspect of organizing the festival or some kind of a happy success story you can share? Yeah. Oh, there's, oh, there's so many moments. I think like each year, the theme, there's like something that stands out, um, whether it's like the wrestling match we had at Lawndale outside. <laughs> we partnered with Doomsday Wrestling and they, they brought their ring and we they built it and then they had that wrestling match. Or then, um, I mean, the most recent year we had, it was our 30th birthday and Patrick Brooks, um, one of our organizing members, built a giant cake, and we had a drag queen pop out of the cake and do a performance. Yes, for the birthday party. <laughs> um, that was pretty amazing. Um, overall, I would have to say, seeing people, you know, tabling at the fest or, or working with zinesters in the community and having the opportunity to help them have their first zine fest and and wanting to make that a good experience and so you know i mean yeah maybe it's someone's first zine fest and they're a little bit shy um you know but this the event is very welcoming you know we try to try to do our best and we because we hope people come back we you know we don't want anyone to have a bad time um, and so it's like, we're always trying to improve that for our vendors and also attendees as well. And so that would be like one of the most rewarding things is like seeing people smiling and, and laughing, you know, looking at the zines and merchandise and talking, you know, the attendees talking to the vendors. It's just like yeah. really, I don't know. It's just, it's just so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean you want to make like the experience as smooth and enjoyable for the attendees but also for the vendors as well and for all the people who are helping you plan the event so they'll want to help you do it again yeah do you guys have um any kind of um feedback survey process for the attendees uh, to help you guys for the next year or anything like that yeah, so we definitely do have one for the vendors that we send out through email. And then for attendees, we've had a survey at the fest um, and basically just like asking, you know, I mean, we don't, we try not to make it too long, um, right. but just like, you know, what were your initial thoughts? What did you like? What, what didn't you like? What would you like to see more of? And then like, is this your first time, you know, being at the fest just to get like that data um, from from people and you know seeing seeing what people are thinking and yeah have there been things that um, that you can think of where you've gotten a certain type of feedback like uh, overwhelmingly or you've gotten the same type of feedback a lot and you're like oh yeah let's let's do that <laughs> has that happened 
Um, yeah, I think some of the vendors were talking about like having, I mean, and that's the thing too, it's like, no matter what, how many times you tell people, it, like there's still things that will fall through the cracks. It's like, um, I mean, we, we started, we have done for a very long time, we had like food and drinks for the vendors that are available. If, if no one is able to like leave their table. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, one of the feedbacks is like, well, sometimes they don't know it's available. And so we are going to have like a, a either a volunteer, or like a dedicated team member to be, to go around to the tables and be like, Hey, do you want a food or, you know, yeah. snack or a drink? Like I will literally bring it to you because sometimes people don't come with a partner or, you yeah. know, friend who can stay at the table. And some, you know, sometimes people don't feel comfortable leaving the table, understandably, you know, yeah. so, um, so I think that is a change that, you know, like we, we say that it's available for them and, you know, we're like, oh yeah, sure. Come get it. But being more proactive about like, yeah, we're just going to bring it to you. You know, it's like yeah. maybe we'll have like a Harry Potter, like snack and drink part. <laughs> <That'd be laughs> yeah. Like, like there's just snack and drink. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. I know that. Um, have you ever been to Bayou City Arts? Uh, a couple times, yeah. I, it yeah, it's been a while. For me. They, um, we have fresh art to do the artist relief tent most years. Oh, um, so that's that's exactly what it is. We we walk around with a little cart full of snacks, and we're like, hey, I want snacks because oh, they can't leave their booth. Yeah, because because I guess for you guys too, like they're they're there they're there kind of like all day, right? Or how long? Yeah, so it's uh, twelve to six p.m., um, yeah. which is you know a large um, chunk of time that you're gonna be sitting there. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I uh, don't want to take up too much of your time. I know we got a late start, but I do. One thing I kind of forgot to touch on um, yeah. is the marketing for the event. So that's probably another thing that's helped you grow to the size over the years. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk briefly about some of the strategies that have been successful for you guys in terms of promotion? Yeah. So one of the really lucky aspects of ZineFest Houston in like, in inheriting this event from Lindsay was that it has or it it had a built in following. Mm -hmm. And so that has really helped us in yeah. terms of, you know, the continuity of the event. Um, and then also I would say the partnerships with other organizations and libraries. Um, are another way for it to market as well. So it's like, you want to keep in mind that when you're doing a workshop or a talk, it's like, that is the marketing, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you have a chance a to tell people about your event. And word of mouth is another one. I think, you know, we, we do get a lot of people just saying like, hey, like, there's a zine fest, you know, it's like, do you want to go? And as well as MailChimp, we've, we've been using that as our, our newsletter um, and social media. We do Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, X, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and so we'll do that. We, we have a large following on Instagram. And so we do rely on that a lot. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's where I find out about events. Yeah, uh, actually, you know, it, it is really interesting to, to see the trends in marketing when it comes to events, because Facebook, I don't really use Facebook that much anymore myself. And so we're like, I don't know, do we need to like put it on there? Right. I mean, we still do because you never know who's going to see it. And, um, but yeah, I would say that like, yeah, Instagram for better or worse, I don't know, <laughs> it's like one of our main marketing tools. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense for the like demographic too, right? Like kind of know where, where, knowing where your audience is, not only in person, but but in line, online and mm -hmm. reaching them there. Yeah. All right, well, is there any other 
advice or anything you'd like to add, um, anything you'd like to say to aspiring fest organizers or just zine stars in general or artists in general? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, if there's a fest idea you have and it's like really niche, I would say, you know, just do it. You know, if you think no one's going to come, like everyone has to start somewhere. So yeah. if it's, um, I don't know, a, a market for like knitted, like food, you know, I mean, like <laughs> food objects or something like I would go because yeah. that sounds really niche and weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think, I think the most important thing is just to like do it if you have the capacity to do, you know, um, or, or reach out to someone like get some friends together and be like, Hey, like I have this idea. What do you think? Like, would you be down? And it doesn't have to be that like, you know, far, you know, it doesn't have to be far reaching, you know, if you have it at a, lo a local coffee shop, like yeah. I would say like, start small and then maybe grow from there if in it doesn't have to be for that long to you know three hours at most you know um but yeah yeah no matter how niche it is you'll probably there's there's people out there that are interested <laughs> in it so even if your friends aren't down like someone will <laughs> someone on the internet <laughs> that you may will be down <laughs> oh for sure yeah there's all kinds of <laughs> things out there speaking of which i learned um recently that you're also the organizer of scissors of texas is that correct oh yes i am oh, that's awesome yeah. i um i go to autumn's glue stick mafia meetups all the time oh okay um, so i haven't been to scissors of texas yet but i'll have to check it out now that now that i know that you're you're the one doing it yeah well um i went to the most recent glue stick mafia what did you there at they wonder uh-huh. Oh, I was there. <laughs> and I, I was like in the front room. Okay. I was like way in the back. <laughs> um, okay. Good to know. Yeah. Well, I'll probably catch you at the next one then. But yeah. Everybody. Thanks again for all of your time and wisdom. And where can people find you and your work or get involved? So my collage work is, uh, I post a lot of it on Instagram uh, at k dot l l a g e s, which is uh, collages. Um, my last name's Carages, so it rhymes with collages. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> if you just search that, uh, my Instagram or website will come up. And for Zine Fest, if you want to search for us, we're at Zine Fest on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and just send us an email or a you know DM and say like, hey, I want to get involved. Um, we're always looking for organizing team members, you know, but it is a commitment, you know. So like, if you want to be on the organizing team, just know that we do have regular meetings when it's like during best season yeah. um but if you want to just volunteer for the day of like we would love to have you as well awesome well thanks again it was great meeting you yeah you too thank you so much have a good one you too